Today, the situation is much, much better. But we still have some uh, parts of Africa where there is a food shortage. And you could say in general terms that many African countries, even during normal weather conditions, are not self-sufficient. So they need food imports or food aid. But I mean, compared to 84, 85, the situation is by far much better. And it is very important for a relief organization to follow this closely and to gradually discontinue or stop relief distribution, because otherwise we will just make things worse by influencing in a negative way on the market. Now that farmers can produce again, we shouldn't interfere with, with free food distribution. Secondly, I think it's a general rule that one should try to uh, limit the period of free distribution as much as possible, because otherwise there is a great risk of creating sort of a dependency among the local population. For centuries, man in Africa has lived with disasters. Disasters themselves are nothing new. Traditional communities survived in traditional ways, keeping together, depending on their own resources, in the face of the powers of nature over which they had no control. Once upon a time, man danced and prayed to the gods for rain, for the water he needed to drink, to give to his animals, to grow his crops. And the rains came or failed, according to the whims of the gods. Man has not found a way to change the whims of the gods, but he has changed the land he lives on. And he, not the gods, has sown the seeds of many modern disasters. The rain that falls on many parts of Africa today can do more harm than good. It falls on land that man has damaged, over-cultivated, deforested, over-grazed. Land that is so eroded it can no longer hold the rain it needs. The rain washes away the last of the soil and the rivers turn to flood. Land that cannot hold water also turns quickly to desert, thousands of acres each year. The droughts and famine of recent years have their roots here, in the changes man has wrought on nature, and not the ravages of nature on man. More and more people, more and more animals, already living a marginal existence, are forced to move into ever more critical and precarious conditions. Conditions which led the Swedish Red Cross into an investigation of recent disaster trends worldwide. A comprehensive study which asked whether so-called natural disasters were not so much acts of God as acts of man. The basic background or, or the main background for the book and the report earlier which was titled Prevention Better Than Cure, was uh, an increasing frustration because uh, as a relief organization, we had to uh, receive more and more appeals for uh, disaster assistance, relief assistance, um, over the years, in the 70s and the early 80s. Uh, not only conflict situations, but also the so-called natural disasters. Uh, more and more victims each year uh, and uh, larger and larger regions being affected. So in 1981-82 we, um, we, we, we decided to um, undertake a thorough study, not on the conflict side, but on the so-called natural disaster side. And we um, studied developments when it comes to floods, famines in connection with drought, earthquakes, volcanoes, heavy storms, cyclones, and so on and so forth. 
we have concluded that nature is but one factor of importance. I mean, a, a famine doesn't take place only because there is too little rain. In order to have mass starvation, there must be a, a, a number of additional factors, but the climate. And I think it's fair to say that the most important factors are poverty as such. I mean, today in the United States, if you have a drought in the southern parts of the United States, very few people, if any people, really suffer from that. No people are dying. But in a country like Ethiopia or, or in, in many countries in Africa where people live on, on uh, self-subsistence farming, when you get a drought and when self-subsistence, the farming doesn't uh, give them enough, they have no resources whatsoever to protect them. And they have very little money to buy for. And that is a very, very important factor. The second important factor is, of course, population growth. More and more people in areas where you have this very fragile situation, aggravating the problems. Thirdly, you have environmental degradation, meaning that even during normal weather conditions, the soil produces less and less food. And on top of that, you may have, as in Ethiopia, civil war or warlike situations, which of course uh, makes problems even worse. And then in some countries you have an agricultural policy, which is not very wise, wisely uh, developed, where food prices are being kept artificially low, in particular in the cities, to please city populations, which means that the farmers are not really stimulated to grow more. And whenever the government tries to raise prices, you have riots and protests, and the city populations tend to be more important than the rural people. So I think that basically we got the message through. I think that people understand that not only for, for famines, but also for other types of so-called natural disasters, climate or nature is just one of many important factors. And that unless we, tr we look at disasters this way, identifying some key factors which we could tackle through development efforts, unless we do that, disasters will just continue to take more and more lives year after year, and larger and larger regions will be disaster prone. From relief to development means that an emergency shelter can be turned in less than a year into the green fields of a community training project, as Konstantinos Berry of the Ethiopian Red Cross explains. The main aspect of the disaster prevention program is actually to help the people at grassroots level. Therefore, no machineries, no big projects will be undertaken. It will be small-scale projects in different peasant associations and peasant cooperatives where they will help themselves and uh, the majority of them will be trained in different techniques of agriculture, forestry, soil conservation, animal husbandry, and health. Big projects usually aim at natural resource conservation, but this time the Red Cross role would be to aim at the people. The people are the main interest. Uh, of course, there is a continuity. If we have to help the people, we have to make their environment more stable. So the project will aim at this, but then it will be with the agreement with the people, uh, with uh, a common planning with the people, and of course with uh, the assistance of the people. With this we hope to gain uh, a start in the normal life, in the normal farming life of the population. One of the major uh, projects would be the introduction of Red Cross committees in every project area. We will have Red Cross committees and with this we assume we will have Red Cross members and we will have Red Cross youth clubs in the schools and within the peasant associations. And the next thing is of course uh, we will have water projects to go with the agricultural projects. We are going to build a self-help uh, small irrigation systems, uh, ponds, reservoirs, and of course we're going to have spring development and spring protection for the provision of clean drinking water. 
if we have uh, if we are not going to construct this kind of dam this area will be a very uh, drought affected area and the people have to move elsewhere or they have to to pass the critical points so they cannot survive small scale activities can have big results like the Red Cross community projects in Ambasel district. Undoing the damage of years of neglect also means replanting the trees that help to hold the land together. An investment in the future that will long outlive the young volunteers who are making it possible. Red Cross and Red Crescent youth groups in many African countries, with the direct support of other young people in northern societies, are now involved in planting literally millions of trees and many millions more will have to be planted if a new generation is going to be able to face a future without again suffering the horrors of the recent past. Involving and motivating the young in their own future is a cornerstone of the many small development projects now springing up in Africa. In community schools like Kombolcha in Ethiopia, just down the road from the site of the Bati shelter one year ago, students do not only have conventional classroom lessons today. Learning to grow vegetables and staple foods is as important as mathematics. And even the youngest students now talk knowledgeably about seed varieties and horticultural practices. Red Cross youth groups in schools all over the country are now as involved in development activities as any of the biggest agencies. Hardly two years ago, the famished people of this region made the disaster headlines of the world. Today, as Konstantinos Beri underlines, the future is up to them. Uh, what we aim to achieve in these uh, programs eventually is a stable society that can absorb the temporary shocks of disasters. So the Red Cross now working as auxiliary to the government will help right at the grassroots level in a self-help program. The protected spring at Kombolcha was one of the first steps the Ethiopian Red Cross took on the road to self-help. For the lack of clean drinking water is one cause of other preventable disasters that put far more people's lives at risk than the catastrophes that make headlines around the world. These are the disasters caused by disease. From inside the spreading slums of Port Sudan on the Red Sea coast, Dr. Bruce Dick, coordinator of the League's Child Alive program, reports on the kind of community project needed to combat these hidden disasters. The Sudanese Red Crescent's Child Alive project is working in the Dems, that's the slum areas of Port Sudan and it's working to support the National Immunisation Programme. And I'd like to ask Jaffa Bamka, one of the driving forces behind this project, to tell you something about it. Most of the people living in this area are originally are nomads. Came to the town, forced to come to the town by the famines and the drought. They are looking for better life. But because they are not skilled and they are, because they are very poor, they are living around the town in a very uh, bad conditions. Jaffa, what are the main problems, the main health problems facing the people here in the Dems of Port Sudan? Here people are facing uh, a lot, a lot of uh, health problems because these areas are not planned and, and they are suffering from a very high uh, rate of mortality due to measles, diphtheria, tuberculosis, typhoids, malnutrition diseases. All inf the infectious diseases are uh, prevalent. Yeah. You mentioned a number of diseases that are preventable by immunization. Why are these diseases still such a problem here? Here now we have uh, the vaccines, we have all uh, the materials, but people uh, do not come to these vaccines because they are not aware, they are not uh, health educated well and there is, uh, there is not much uh, mobilization. On the one hand, the deaths and disabilities that occur as a, as a result of the um, 
vaccine preventable diseases are they're far greater than the number of deaths and disabilities that occur as a result of either acute or long-term disasters. I think that's one thing that we need to recognize, that these are what we are becoming to be known as the hidden disasters. The other thing, of course, is that if we can immunize communities before they are displaced, then when they're displaced, when they become refugees or when they're displaced for other reasons, then they won't get these diseases. That's the first thing. And the second thing is that, of course, if national societies are already able to motivate people for immunization, or in the case of diarrheal diseases, for example, already have the knowledge about how to put ideas across about oral rehydration and the prevention of diarrheal diseases, then they're in a very good position to respond to refugees and other displaced communities if and when it's required. The problem is there is no demand. People are not aware. People are not coming. People are in need of more health education and more community mobilization. And uh, I think this can only be, be made by the people, by the volunteers, and by the Red Crescent Society, because the Red Crescent Society is very respectful by the people, because they rescued them during the famine and during the drought town, time and hard times. So I think they are the best to do this job. We cannot do it as a government. I think the Red Cross pl could play uh, an important role in the following uh, uh, aspects. First of all, inform about the problems. We have a vast experience when it comes to disaster and disaster relief. We know about the problems, we know about the people suffering, and we have now identified the causes. We should speak out. And I think we have a status uh, so that people listen to us. So it's very important that given the field experience we have that we speak out, mold opinion, inform people, create awareness. Secondly, because we need a more integrated approach to relief and development, I cannot distinguish between relief work and development work in many of these areas. I think we have to become more involved in the long-term aspects. And if we inform people about these long-term aspects, we should also live like we learn, like we teach. Namely, start small-scale, modest-scale programs aimed at preventing further disasters. And because the problems are so great, and because of the rapid deterioration in many, many and, uh, low, uh, ecosystems, deforestation, soil, etc., we just have to join hand in hand with many, many other organizations. We have used to say that problems of this kind should be tackled by governments and international organizations like the UN. Well, it may be right in theory, but in practice we know that, the, that governments and, and the UN is doing too little. So why not join in in this very, very important task? Of course, then you need to, to educate our own people, train our own people so that they are well prepared to carry out these tasks. Thank you.